Most people would agree that Eden Zero is better than Samurai 8, but when you compare Mashima to Kishimoto, suddenly things get a little more controversial. To explore that idea and how the two authors actually compare, I have with me Kryptonian Saiyan. Why don't you say hi real quick? Hey, what's going on everybody, man? It's your boy Kryptonian Saiyan slash Naruto Explain, and I'm so excited to be here on OG's channel just to be talking about a couple of series that I really enjoy a lot. Yeah, man. Part of the reason I wanted to have you on was like before I really even got into Eden Zero, I saw you talking about it on Twitter and I remember asking you like, okay, so like what what makes you so crazy about this series? And you're like, it's just everything I loved about Rave Master, but better. But would you say that's pretty accurate? Yeah. Like Eden Zero takes a lot of the best elements of Rave Master and it does them a lot better and you can really see Mashima's growth as a mangaka and Eden Zero, you can really see it with his writing as well. So then moving from that, because I would pretty much agree, obviously I have my own thoughts on Rave Master, but I want to ask you, what sticks out to you the most about Rave Master? Like what makes Rave Master a good story, but also what makes it unique and what are some of the strengths of Mashima that stick out in that story? So I would say one of the things that really grabs me about Rave Master is that when you start off the story, you have Haru following the uh, standard hero's journey where he's in his everyday life and he has that life-changing moment where he meets the uh, first Rave Master. And uh, with Haru, for a moment you see how he's getting that call to action, he's resisting it a bit, but once he embraces that call to action, you get into the... Uh, adventure element and just the way that going to the different aspects of the continent how they've all got the music themes around them and everything where you got like blue city and uh, hip hop hip hop city and etc that quest idea of just going after the different raves and Haru meeting Ellie and just having that moment where the two of them are, are growing alongside one another and how you start off being captivated by Haru's story, which just kind of feels like boy goes out into the world and he's got this greater calling. But then when you get introduced to Ellie and you start realizing that Haru and Ellie's destinies might be linked and you're seeing her uh, slowly start to get her memories back, it makes you more invested in uh, her as a character and they just bounce off of each other so well. And like, it's got those adventure elements that I love from early Dragon Ball. So for me, it just took me back to being a little kid again when I first started reading it. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think the way I would describe like what the reading experience is like uh, for Elevator Pitch, it's like you get into it for the goofy, traditional, like boy meets world adventure. But by the second half, you stay for the payoff for the characters like Ellie, the intense plot also just the carefully crafted story. Now, I want to ask you, because I think we both agree, Rave Master is really good. Eden Zero, also very good. So I want to ask you, what are some specific examples of how Mashima has taken his experience, what he's learned in Rave Master, and applied it to Eden Zero? I'd say the first thing that really stands out is when you compare and contrast Ellie and Rebecca, you know, Ellie was a character. She had her dim-witted moments, especially early on in the uh, Rave Master story, but she had moments where she was very uh, quick-witted on her feet, like when she's hiding Haru from the people that were looking for him at the dog racing track. But when it comes to fighting and everything, she also had a tendency at times to kind of feel like a damsel in distress where, you know, she had to kind of be rescued. But like with Eden Zero, when you get to Rebecca, she combines... Uh, that feistiness that you see with Ellie and that bubbly attitude that Ellie had at times, uh, along with some of the crazy aspect to her, but she also has Lucy's big brain intelligence. And with Rebecca, she doesn't hesitate when it comes time to fight. She gets her hands dirty. She's all in it. She'll grab Happy. He'll transform into the gun. She'll start shooting. Uh, when they're on that ship and everything, when they first meet Elise, uh, it looks like she's going to be fan serviced out. And then she reverses the tables and she has Weiss and she's tickling them and everything. Like, so you see some of that goofy element that you saw in the first two series. So just seeing that aspect of it, that was really good because I like strong female characters. And if you're going to be a uh, co-main character, 
you really got to pull your weight. And like Rebecca pulls her weight, which, you know, Ellie, I feel like the narrative helped her pull her weight more. But with this, it feels more organic. She gets you right from the jump. And then when you start looking at the other aspects of the story, much like how Rave Master had a more serious tone than Fairy Tale, Eden Zero, before you even get to a hundred chapters in, you realize very quickly, like when you meet Drac and Joe, you're like, oh crap, this is serious. This this is has potential to get dark and it just gets progressively darker from there. And like, you know, earlier on in the year we had that big moment, won't go into spoilers, but there's a moment that just absolutely just shatters your heart. And whereas like with Fairy Tale, there are fake out deaths and like in uh Rave Master, there were some deaths that happened, but there are two where you think like this is it and it's like oh okay wait a second like that wasn't as bad as i thought with this this was for keats and you can just tell he was intent on ripping out the reader's hearts when he did it. and I, I feel like the first two were like the test run and now this one's the one where he's like i'm taking all my experiences and i'm loading them up and we're just gonna go full steam ahead here i'm really glad you brought up rebecca because this is a great contrasting point with Kishimoto and his works, but specifically with Mashima. I don't really think anyone would say Ellie is a bad female character, in fact a lot of people like her, but she's definitely that more traditional female character of like the damsel in distress. Rebecca is so well written because she's smart and she's strong, but also she's just a relatable female character, like to all the like sweaty nerds out there, I don't know if you've actually interacted with some girls, but a lot of them actually play video games and like <laughs> eat junk food and like watch anime. It's not just like this rare breed of girls, like there's a lot of them like that. So it's nice to see someone like Rebecca in the story. It makes it a lot more relevant and relatable. Now moving on, right? So to get to the broader topic of the video, not a lot of people would be quick to compare Mashima to someone like Kishimoto, especially when, like, you think about it, you're comparing the author of Fairy Tale to the author of Naruto. But we're both getting at this idea of, like, Mashima is so good at just evolving, learning, taking his experience, and growing from it. And this isn't to say anything bad about Kishimoto, but clearly there was this disconnect. So, Let's start off here, and I think I think the answer is fairly obvious. Would you say Eden Zero is better than Samurai Eight? Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't even hesitate to say that. Like Samurai Eight, like there are really good ideas, and I kind of feel like part of the problem is especially early on, like you can tell there was so much setup uh trying to establish the universe. It almost felt like, in my opinion, overload. Whereas like with Eden Zero, you start out on uh, you start out on Grand Bell and then you go to Blue Garden and then like the universe starts to slowly start expanding. You know right from the start that, you know, this is part of a bigger universe, but the way everything escalated and takes you along the ride for Eden Zero is done a lot better. Uh, the characters in terms of uh, some of like the some of the motivations like there isn't as much uh, melodrama in some cases but there is melodrama don't get me wrong like Weiss with his backstory and everything like in terms of like what uh, Weiss and uh, Jin and uh, his sister without going into spoilers there's definitely melodrama there but like the characters in Eden Zero those are they, they feel like people you would just kick it with and I think that there's some there's something to that and then the other thing is like Eden Zero, and people might get mad at me for this, but like Eden Zero has better art than what you had in Samurai 8. You know, like and it's the small things. Like, you know, I don't really go into big detail in my chapter reviews because, you know, people hate when I criticize the panel in Boruto, but like it's Samurai 8 has similar problems. Like with Samurai 8, if you pay attention like early on, there was a lot of white and like the backgrounds are very detailed, but like because you had so much white in there, it wasn't as easy to focus in on some of the stuff that's going on in the panels at times. Like the panels are too small. Like he wasn't letting the scene breathe out in the way that he should. And like with Mashima, everything kind of flows. It's basic paneling, but like when you get to expressions, the expressions are so good. The build up towards it is just so good. Like you can tell he 
has a full grasp of what it means to be a master anticipation to build up the panels leading to like the big moment where like Shiki just like decks somebody in the face or Rebecca's going off or Weiss is going off of Arsenal or you know when one of the characters breaks down and starts crying like the scene we talked about earlier with the death that takes place if you look at all those expressions everybody had a different expression but it almost feels like if that was just one person you're all watching one person slowly come to the realization that like oh my god somebody that i really care about is dying and like you get that payoff at the end where you see one of the characters just absolutely lose it after that big scene takes place and like you didn't have that same timing with samurai 8 i feel like it tried to come into its own towards the end and it just missed the boat and i think that's the difference between Okubo, somebody who was an assistant for a long time and has potential, and somebody like Mashima, who he's been doing this for 20 years now. So that's actually a great point. Now I want to ask you, Mashima and Kishimoto have both had tremendous pressures on them. A lot because like they're both very successful, so they get a lot of projects. But you look at Mashima, right? He's got Eden Zero. He's got Fairy Tale, 100 Year Quest. He's got Gate of Nightmares, the game he does the art for, and the manga, and he's got his YouTube channel, and he's got probably a bunch of other stuff, and he's directly involved in all that. Then you look at Kishimoto, and somehow, I said it to you earlier, like, he was somehow directly involved with these projects, but then at the same time, not involved enough. Like, it just, for whatever reason, just that dynamic did not work. It just wasn't succeeding. So I want to ask you, I obviously don't think that Samurai 8 is a proper reflection of Kishimoto and his capacity as an artist and as a writer, but when you compare their ability to replicate success, to take what they've learned in their better stories and replicate that, recreate it in a new story, do you think this is a valid justification to say, Mashima not necessarily better, but at the very least, in that same tier as someone like Kishimoto. You can't discount somebody's success over a consistent period. Like, it's one thing to say, like, okay, Naruto's bigger. Absolutely. Like, nobody takes that away from Masashi Kishimoto. But it is worth noting, when you look at Hiro Mashima, he's done something that not very many mangaka have done. And I don't think that people fully grasp what you're seeing right here like Hiro Mashima has come with back to back to back hits and like while Eden Zero doesn't sell as much as Rave Master Rave Master still sold almost 30 million copies it's like at 29 something uh Fairy Tale sold 75 million like it's one of those things where those were not small titles like Rave Master to come out the gate in your series is as big or almost as big as something like Black Clover, which is one of the biggest series that's out right now, that is an accomplishment. But then to come back again a few years later and have a series that triples, damn near triples what you did before, you don't see that often. Like, you know, Takahashi did it with uh, Ramen One and a Half, and she did it again with uh, Inuyasha. Uh, Akira Toyama did it with Dr. Slump and with Dragon Ball. Togashi did it with Yu Yu Hakusho and with, with uh, Hunter Hunter. Like, you've seen other mangaka come back back to back, but not every mangaka can replicate that same success. And I think that to discount Hiro Mashima because he's got more than one series and to say, well, you know, he's only taking the same art styles and everything like that and like by that by that extent right there he shouldn't be in the same category as somebody like Kishimoto it's like okay like you read Samurai 8 you know one of the manga color, uh, covers one of the characters looks like they're doing a, a, a Rasengan it's just kind of floating because you got the space element uh some of the characters you look at them you know one of the uh, I forget the character's name is uh one of the adults I mean that looks like Hokage Naruto like the face strips and everything like that was drawn by a different mangaka but that's off of Kishimoto's character sheets and it's like that's somebody's art style and so if you want to take away the credit for that because you're saying the designs look too similar like I mean even with 
Taite Kubo with this uh, new uh, one shot that he had with, uh, well not one shot, but like a, a series of chapters, Burn the Witch. When you look at some of those characters, like, you know, they look like, uh, one of them look like a mix between Byakuya and Orihime. To be that consistent and to register with the marketplace over and over like that to do 100 million copies off of two series or over 100 million copies of two series, it means your work has landed. And at the end of the day, we have a vocal minority that, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down online, but the Japanese fans, they see it. Manga is a much better uh, representation over there because there's so many different options. It's way more widespread than it is here. And for you to push numbers like that in Japan, with all those options consistently, you cannot take away from that. Whereas with Samurai 8, the fans saw it and it was one of the lowest selling manga volumes that we had in recent Shonen Jump history. You know, so I mean, I think that that's something with it. There's just something about the writing where he wasn't able to connect, whereas Mashima has been able to consistently connect, even with Eden Zero uh, selling like a steady. 40, 50,000 uh, volumes per uh, vo uh, volumes, uh, copies per volume. Even with something like that, it's still kind of showing you like it's still steady moving along. And when we look up, this might be a series that does between five and 10 million copies. That's nothing to sniff your nose up at because there are a lot of series that don't even get to that watermark. I couldn't have said it better myself. And I think people need to give Mashima way more credit than he currently receives. And I think people that are fairy tale haters just need to get over themselves. I think that's really <laughs> what it comes down to. Um, but I think this is a good point to wrap it up. I think we got a lot of good conversation. And um, just before we close things out, is there anything else you want to share with everyone? Yeah, I, I definitely say if you haven't read Rave Master, like if, if you're somebody like you absolutely hate it fairy tale, if you think that it's fairy tale in space, you are largely mistaken and it's not just me i know for a fact like you got Knox from project manga like you know Knox is looking at it like man i don't know and you know he did his live read throughs and everything and like you know Knox is like it's got fan service but you can tell this is thought out you don't do something like a chrono page and not put some thought into what you're doing like it's so easy to follow and it's so detailed i those are two series i'm like if you hate mashima and fairy tales your only exposure you owe it to yourself before you slander them to at least check out the other two series again couldn't agree more but just to close things out uh kryptonian saying thank you very much for joining me today oh man thank you for having me on man it was a pleasure of course of course anytime guys read rave master read eden zero check out kryptonian saying um hopefully we were able to change your mind today Mashima definitely deserves more credit, but thank you for listening, and the both of us hope to hear from you soon. <laughs>